So we're reading from the Old Testament in uh, 1 Samuel. I'm reading from 1 Samuel to 1 to 20. There was a certain man in Ramatha, in Zurite, Azurite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elakan, the son of Jerichon, the son of Elahi, the son of Toho, the son of Zoph, the son of Zoph, and Az- 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 Ephraimite. He had two wives, one called Hannah and the other Paraniah. Paraniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hephaniah and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah, to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Phinea and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, the husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why, have, why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shalom, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were not moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanon lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of the time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I had asked the Lord of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to be starting a new series this morning uh, in First Samuel. Now, First and Second Samuel, to my way of thinking, is a is a mighty theological uh, work of uh, uh, literature, and it tackles some big themes such as kingship and covenant. And throughout First and Second Samuel, we see the lives of uh, Samuel, Saul, and David intertwined and. I find the interaction of a relationship of these three men, to me, I think, is uh, perhaps the most uh, fascinating uh, relationships within the Bible, um, in my opinion. If you might disagree, and that's okay, we can have a scholarly uh, disputation over morning tea. Uh, But it it really is a a fascinating uh, relationship that exists between them. Now, over the next seven weeks, uh, we're just going to be looking at, at a small section of First Samuel. Um, and uh, we're going to see uh, the 
that 1 Samuel 1 to 7 deals with the fall of Israel and finishes with its restoration. Now, 1 Samuel, it picks up where the book of Judges leaves off. And by the end of Judges, uh, sadly, the nation of Israel has fallen into total barbarism. Uh, The final verse of Judges says this, In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. So it's it's a picture of chaos. And of course, Israel did have a king. It's just no one was listening to him. Israel's king was God. And into this chaos comes a young boy who under God will change a nation. This young boy is Samuel and he'll become the the judge, the prophet and the priest of Israel of his time. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray that as we look at your word this morning that you would open up the truth of it to us that through your spirit we would grasp onto this word and that it would be at work in our, in our hearts and in our minds. In Lord Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you've got your Bible in front of you or, or your phone, which, which has been put onto silent, uh, we're going to start off uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 2, where we meet a guy called Elkanah. Now he gets a... a Quite a bit of airtime over the first part of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, he he got, gets a good solid five or six verses. And generally speaking, when we see uh, someone getting this much attention at the beginning of a book, it's a signal for us, pay attention to this guy because he's going to be important. Let's have a look at what we find out. So we find out about Elkanah that he's from a town called Ramathane, uh, five miles north of Jerusalem. Okay, that's uh, verse 1. We find out that Ramathane is from the land allotted to the tribe of Ephraim under Joshua after the conquest of the promised land. Uh, Verse 1. Elkanah is a descendant of a guy named Zuth. Uh, Verse 2. Zuth is Elkanah's great, great grandfather and Elkanah is probably a Levite based on a genealogy that we see in first chronicles chapter 6 we see Elkanah had two wives Penina and Hannah verse 2 Penina had many children but Hannah had none we also see that Elkanah was a, a religiously diligent man let's have a look at verse 3 year after year This man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas... Remember those two names as well. Those two lads are going to come into the picture a little bit more in chapter 2. The two sons of Eli were priests of the Lord. Okay, Eli as well, he's going to come into the story soon as well. So we also see in verse 5... But he wasn't just religiously diligent, but Elkanah loved Hannah as well. You know at the start how I said, generally when you get a lot of information about someone at the start of a book, he's going to be pretty significant going forward? Well, you can scratch that. (laughs) You hear of Hannah two more times in in chapter 2, and that's just like a fleeting mention. Right? This is pretty much Elkanah's only time to shine in these uh, uh, verses in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. So we need to think to ourselves, well, if he's not going to be a significant player moving forward, why are we getting all this information about him at the start? One idea could be that the author of uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, he's trying to set himself up as an authority with what he's going to talk about. Uh, in in the ensuing narrative. He's saying, you know, look at me. I know all this information about the background of this guy Samuel who I'm going to be speaking about. Because I know all this, you can trust the rest of what I'm going to say as well. So now the focus shifts to Hannah. And Hannah was being tormented by the other wife, Penina, because Hannah had no children. Let's have a look at verse 6 to 7. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, 
Her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. God set up the pattern for marriage in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. One man, one wife. Uh, as so often happens when, when humanity decides to take God's rules and massage them a little bit, chaos and heartbreak usually is the result of that. And this is a recurring theme uh, in in the scriptures, uh, particularly in Genesis. We see problems uh, between uh, Sarah and Hagar in the Abraham story. Or well, Hagar was not Abraham's um, wife, but he had a child through her. And predictably, it led to problems. Uh, we see this uh, two-wife uh, torment situation playing out as well with uh, Leah and Rachel, Jacob's two wives who are also sisters and we see it happening again here with uh, Penina and Hannah so uh, note to selves God's way is the best way <laughs> however let's put ourselves in Hannah's shoes for just a moment because it's easy as we read some of these ancient texts to be a little bit emotionally disconnected from them but think about Hannah she was sharing her husband with another woman. Would that be a good situation, ladies? I don't think so. I don't think so. She was unable to have children, which is hard now for, um, I'll, I'll say ladies, but even men as well, uh, if you want children but can't have them. But back then, it wasn't just hard. It was a source of shame if you could not have children. She was being tormented by the rival wife. She was at the point she was weeping and not wanting to eat. When we see Hannah, she's a woman in terrible distress. Things are not going well for her at the moment, to put it mildly. We see Elkanah try to console Hannah in verse 8, but to no avail. Elkanah was a significant part of causing this problem by taking on two wives, so there's probably little chance he could adequately console her. So let's move on. We'll have a look at verse 9 to 20 now. Uh, Elkanah and the family, including Hannah, they go up to a place called Shiloh uh, to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, Shiloh is about 31 kilometres north of Jerusalem and it was the place where uh, the tabernacle was kept okay that was the tabernacle was the central place of worship for Israel at the time uh, it's where the ark of the covenant was maintained which was the the golden chest with the ten commandments God had given to Moses on it uh, so so they went up there because you got to remember as well this is before the time of Solomon, before the time the, the permanent temple was built. Uh, so the, they had like a, a sort of semi-permanent um, structure set up, very similar to what the, the tabernacle would have been when the, Mo the Israelites were travelling with Moses through the wilderness. And at this time, verse 10 tells us that Hannah was in deep anguish. And weeping bitterly. Verse 11 tells us that she was in misery. Verse 15, she was deeply troubled. She was having her own dark night of the soul. And so she prayed to the Lord. And in this prayer, she made a vow. Let's have a look at verse 11. Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. So if God gave Hannah a son, she would give that son to him. Now isn't that amazing? The one thing she wants more than anything in the whole world 
but she's asking God for, and if God gives it to her, she will give it back to him. She also said he would never cut his hair. So she's making a vow on behalf of this son that she wants. Uh, so this would, this would make her son a, uh, a, a priest in the Nazarite sect. Okay, Think Samson uh, from Judges. Uh, however, usually um, with the Nazarites, they wouldn't cut their hair. Uh, they wouldn't drink any um, fermented drinks. Let's say we'll call it alcohol. Uh, they wouldn't eat any fruit off the vine. So they, there's certain things they won't do. Usually they would take this vow, Numbers 6 tells us, for a, like a discrete period of time. But Hannah is promising this for his whole life. Are we getting a sense of how desperate Hannah is at this point in time? And then we see in verse 9 that uh, Eli, the priest, was sitting nearby and he sees Hannah praying in tears. Let's have a look, verse 12 to 14. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and he said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Imagine this scenario for a moment, if you will. You know, you're out the front on the steps. You can't get into the church because I've locked the door. And I, I, I come and you're out there, you're, you're crying, uh, you're praying quietly. And I come out of my office to, you know, stretch, get a bit of, bit of sunshine. And I say to you, get out of here, you're drunk, move on. What would you think of my ability as a, a priest or a pastor at that point of time? You'd, you'd be calling it into question, rightfully so. Yet this is exactly what Eli does to Hannah. She was pouring her heart out to God and he thought she was a drunk. This is telling us something about Eli. This guy's an incompetent priest. Okay? You might say, look, maybe he's just made a mistake. Well, it's a pretty bad mistake to make. And we build the case more in chapter 2 about Eli's incompetence as a priest. But Hannah explains herself to him. Verse 15, she says, I'm deeply troubled. I'm pouring out my soul to the Lord. I'm not wicked. I'm praying. And then Eli sort of takes a bit of a step back a little bit here in verse 17. Uh, quite frankly, I feel like maybe it's a bit of a dismissive blessing. He says, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. All right, so it's better than calling her a drunk and telling her to move on. But I, I feel like based on what he's just said to her, and then he says this very quick blessing I just feel like it's a bit dismissive I don't know that's probably me reading what's reading into what's there a little bit but it just feels a bit dismissive and again we see a bit more about Eli's incompetence uh, next week but there's no evidence of an apology oh hey sorry I called you a drunk <laughs> you're praying my bad there's no evidence of that there's no evidence he tried to comfort her. There's no evidence that he even knew what she was grieving about. Very little, little evidence of any care. May God give you what you want. See you later. However, by the grace of God, and not from Eli, um, Hannah left there feeling better, feeling more uplifted. And verses 19 to 20 goes on and tell us, with thanks to God, Hannah had her little boy. She had her baby. And she called him Samuel. Now she called him Samuel because the, the Hebrew name for Samuel sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for heard by God. You'll, you'll find often in the Old Testament that, that the names of uh, children who were born 
will uh, very much reflect the situation in which they were born. And with Samuel, that's, that's no different. Okay, now we're going to head into verse 21 to 28, which I didn't include in today's reading. Um, so we're happy. You know, the heartbroken and soul-destroyed Hannah has had her baby. It's good news. But now there's a new tension, isn't there? Because we, we remember the vow that she made to God. We're thinking to ourselves, come on God, does she really have to give up her son? Have you only given her this child just so she can lose him again? Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 warns us about making oaths to God. He says, don't swear by God. Just simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Because he doesn't want God's name being taken advantage of. Neither does he, did he want people making oaths to God which they would not and could not fulfill. Because even if they didn't take their oath seriously, God did. So was this an oath that Hannah made in desperation without thinking it through properly? We don't know. It's possible. But God is, he's not unkind, he's not uncaring. He understands that sometimes we do make oaths in, in a, um, probably that we haven't thought through as well as we could have. In Numbers chapter 30, verse 12, he writes in regards to wives making oaths. But if her husband nullifies her vow, then he hears about when he hears about them, then none of the vows or pledges that come from her lips will stand. Her husband has nullified them, and the Lord will release her. So uh, the book of Numbers in the Old Covenant sets out that there's this sort of, uh, I guess, um, little safety valve for, for vows, but, um, vows that are made in an ill-considered way. Let's have a look. There's... Does Elkanah bring this up? Does he mention this? Verse 21. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she was weaned. So Elkanah had an opportunity to ask Hannah, would you like me to annul your vow before God? But interestingly, he didn't. Now, would Hannah have wanted him to? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I just find it interesting that Elkanah could have offered that but he failed to do so. She said she would take her son uh, to, to be handed over when he was weaned. So in the, in the ancient world, generally, I'm led to believe a baby would be weaned at probably two to three. They would go a bit longer than we do in modern society. Uh, and um, Hannah kept her word. We see in verse 24 to 28 that Hannah takes Samuel, at one would assume, the age of two to three, and hands him over to Eli to be trained as a priest. And we finish up uh, chapter one with this simple clause, and Samuel worshipped God there. So next week we'll see a little bit more about how Samuel's training progresses under the incompetent priest Eli. So let's uh, think to ourselves for a moment, what would this passage have meant to the people who first heard and read it back in ancient times? So to do that, we need to think, when was First and Second Samuel written down? Now, bearing in mind, First and Second Samuel are not separate works. They're the same work. First Samuel is written on one scroll. Second Samuel is written on a second scroll. That's why it's called First and Second Samuel. 
So the commentators suggest it was probably written sometime after the death of Solomon and the division of the uh, kingdom of Israel. Uh, so Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, decided he would uh, work the people really hard against the advice of his elders, and that caused half of Israel to rebel against him. So the northern half, which split off from Israel, were maintained the name Israel, so that was up north, and the part of uh, Israel that stayed with uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam uh, was, took on the name Judah, as that was the biggest tribe um, down there. So that's where the commentators think it was written, probably uh, after the death of Solomon and the splitting of the, um, the kingdom of Israel. Why is that? Well, it's... Um, the author refers to, in chapter 11, verse 8, and 17, verse 25, the men of Judah and Israel. Now, if, a, if it had been written before the split, it would have just said the men of Israel. But the fact that the author referred to the men of Judah and Israel is, is perhaps a hint that it was written after the split. There's a reference in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 6, to the kings, plural, of Judah. So obviously by the time uh, the story of Samuel had been written down, we've, we've had more than one king. Uh, and it stands to reason that the author must have had access to a lot of information about Samuel, Saul and David to be able to write the detailed account that he did. So you put all that into a pot, mix it up, and it seems to suggest it was probably written um, after the time of Solomon and the split of the kingdom of Israel. So, we got a rough idea when people first read this story. Uh, so, so what would it have meant to the people of that time? Uh, during the kingship of Israel, uh, there were often external threats, firstly from Assyria, and we have a serious threat, uh, and then after Assyria, from Babylon. And so there were times during the kings of Israel that uh, Israel was in a pretty desperate, vulnerable state. Sort of a little bit like Hannah was in a desperate and vulnerable state when she's praying to God, please give me a child. And so one would hope the original readers would have seen this account of Hannah turning to God when she was desperate, vulnerable and weak and God answering her prayer is to take her lead from that and when they were being assaulted from all sides and all things seemed hopeless, Turn to God. Ask God for help. Sadly, they often didn't do that. They turned to neighbouring nations for help and uh, it, it, it never worked out. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus was in a desperate and vulnerable state. He was having his own dark night of the soul on the night before he was crucified. In Matthew chapter 26, he said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me, he's speaking to his disciples. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not I will, but as you will. Then in verse 42, again, he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And Luke's gospel adds, chapter 22, verse 44, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When Jesus suffered his dark night of a soul, he turned to his father in prayer. Hannah and Jesus have modelled for us faithfulness under fire. Even when all things were going wrong, they didn't turn away from God, they turned to God. Now I know we've all been through hard times. Many of us have suffered significant loss over the last few years. suffered the loss of uh, <coughs> loved ones, suffered from cancer, 
suffered from seeing our kids go through difficult situations and struggles of their own. We faced the hurt and the uncertainty that characterises this world that we live in. And oftentimes we felt hopeless and helpless because we can't change what's happened or is happening around us. It's not a nice feeling to be helpless to change an awful situation. At times like these, it reminds us how vulnerable we really are. But we're not as bulletproof and strong as what we like to think when times are calm and easy. It's normal. In difficult times, to wish we were stronger, more influential, more knowledgeable. But I'm not, (laughs) and you're not. I'm just me, and you're just you. But there is someone who's stronger, more influential, more knowledgeable, and more powerful, and so much more than even that. It's our Father in heaven. Psalm 104 describes him as the one who has stretched out the heavens, the one who laid the earth on its foundations, the one who rebuked the waters and they fled, and he's the one who sent his son to die for you and the one who raised him back to life again. His father loves you. He really does. I beg you, and I don't think I can use stronger language than that, I beg you, in your own dark night of a soul, don't give in to hopelessness and despair, but turn to God, not away from him. You should always pray, but in the context of this passage, I want to emphasise the necessity of turning to God in prayer when when you're at your weakest, your most vulnerable, when you're at your lowest. And we know he will hear you. He will strengthen you and comfort you. And he will answer your prayer according to his will, which is always for our good, even if that's hard sometimes to, to see in the moment. In the bitterness of soul and weeping, Hannah fell on her knees before God and declared her dependence on God. And God didn't let her down. When the lights go out and it feels like darkness is just closing in around you, turn to God. He didn't let Hannah down and he won't let you down either. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, We thank you that you are both loving and powerful. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you will answer them. Lord, I just ask that when we experience our dark nights of a soul, help us not to turn away from you in despondency, but to turn to you in prayer and in hope. Amen.